Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, episode 381. In this bonus episode of Do Not Be Hasty, we'll be considering the highly important and controversial question, what did Tolkien say Lord of the Rings was about? We'll do so by exploring Tolkien's forward to the Lord of the Rings. Or should I say, four words. Indeed, the first and second editions contain entirely different forewords by Tolkien, and each has its own peculiarities that will be of interest to all of us Tolkien deep divers. However, before we begin, I'd like to give a double up air five to our amazing fellowship. Stick em up fellowship. Three, two, one. Whoops. Very nice. Special thanks to this episode's executive producers, Caitlin of T with Tolkien, John R, KG, Saber Systems, and Jeremy D. Also, a shout out to those celebrating their fellowship anniversary in July of 2024. Carolyn S, Spencer M, Seb M, Matthew W, Wordy, David B, and Chris L. Thank you all so much for sticking with us over the years. All right. Well, before we get too far down the road on our epic Do Not Be Hasty journey, we'll need to take a step back for a few episodes and consider two important writings included with most editions of Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's Forward and the book's prologue. With this episode, we'll begin that process. If a book features a foreword, you, like me, probably tend to skip over it. After all, forewords are usually not even written by the author and are not an actual part of the story. Furthermore, they are usually quite dry. However, most books are not Lord of the Rings, and most forewords are not written by J.R.R. Tolkien. While most of us, including myself, probably skipped the foreword on first read, once the Middle-Earth Legendarium has grabbed hold of you, Tolkien's foreword to Lord of the Rings is simply another invaluable source of information about what I, and many others, consider the greatest novel ever written. In this episode of Do Not Be Hasty, we'll chiefly consider the question, what did Tolkien say Lord of the Rings was about, as we explore the forewords to the first and second editions of the book? Well, let's kick things off with the first edition, the first edition forward. So the forward to the first edition was published in 1954 with The Fellowship of the Ring. While it's no longer available as part of the published editions of The Lord of the Rings, you can find the whole thing in the Hammond and Skull Reader's Companion, uh, let's see, this thing right here, right behind me, right there as I'm pointing to it on my bookshelf. Alternatively, you can piece it together from Snippets and the Peoples of Middle-Earth, otherwise known as Volume 12 in the History of Middle-Earth series. I think that one's right. Whoop. Let me see if I can do it. There we go. I think it's that one right there. Uh, kind of hard to tell without turning around. All right. Well, let's break down what's contained in Tolkien's first edition of The Lord of the Rings Forward pull it up here on my helper screen all right so uh as we look at this here this is a um this is a scan of what's in the reader's companion uh there uh it's actually contained in their section on the forward to the second edition uh it begins as you can see uh the actual first edition reproduction uh forward begins there and uh, it lasts about another full page as well as a little bit on a third page. So what's in there? Well, it really contains um, about uh, seven paragraphs. Uh, let me break down these paragraphs for you. So the first paragraph, uh, it, Tolkien kind of explains that this is all a, um, a history that he has compiled and drawn from this mysterious book called the Red Book of Westmarch. Uh, these are memoirs of the renowned hobbits Bilbo and Frodo. They're handed down by Sam's descendants, the Fair Barons of Westmarch. Uh, let me just kind of read this first paragraph for you so you can get a taste of it. This tale, which has grown to be almost a history of the Great War of the Ring, is drawn for, for the most part from the memoirs of the renowned hobbits Bilbo and Frodo as they are preserved in the West Red Book of Westmarch. The chief monument of hobbit lore is so-called because it was compiled, repeatedly copied, and enlarged and handed down in the family of the Fair Barons of Westmarch, descended from the Master Samwise, of whom this tale has much to say. Uh, just a quick note on the Fair Barons here. So the Fair Barons were the uh, were Sam's descendants through his daughter Eleanor, right? So Eleanor marries uh, Fastred of Greenholm, and then through their line uh, comes this Fair Barons of uh, Westmarch. Um, so that's just a little bit about uh, what that has to do with. In the second paragraph, Tolkien says that 
uh, the information that he's compiled here was supplemented with information from the Book of Kings. Um, so this is a book that was maintained for uh, Gondor. Um, it, Tolkien says he adhered closely to the words of the original from which he is drawing. Um, he says, Bilbo was not assiduous nor an orderly narrator, and his account is involved and discursive and sometimes confused. Uh, this is a funny little just note. And again, I'll kind of come back to what Tolkien is doing here as I, I'm just kind of briefly scanning the paragraphs, uh, here, but I have a few thoughts on, you know, what Tolkien was doing here in this first edition forward. Uh, but a funny little comment about, uh, Bilbo, not assiduous, not an orderly, orderly narrator, and his account is involved in discurf discursive and somewhat confused. Uh, sometimes I feel like that would be a good description of this podcast, but I do my best. Uh, and I feel like I'm in good company if that's how Tolkien describes Bilbo. I also think that perhaps Tolkien uh, is reflected in Bilbo's personality there. He must be, of course. Uh, third paragraph, he says, this is not a book written for children. Uh, this is an idea that Tolkien, over the course of his career, somewhat combated, if you will. Um, Tolkien did not consider the genre that he was writing in uh, being, you know, fairy story, tales of the perilous realm, um, these kind of fantasy legends, uh, high fantasy works. He did not consider these to be uh, stories for children. Um, he was okay with them appealing to children. He even thought they would appeal to children for various reasons. But, um, but he did not consider himself to be writing for children. All right. Uh, paragraph four. Uh, is he says it's dedicated. This book is dedicated to all admirers of Bilbo, especially Tolkien's children and the Inklings. Um, of course, his children were very helpful to him in the writing of the story. Uh, let me turn off my little tool there for highlighting. Um, uh, his children were very helpful to him in the labors of composition. Um, and he, and he kind of, again, winkingly says, if composition is a just word and these pages do not deserve all that I have said about Bilbo's work. Uh, paragraph five, he says, why readers of The Hobbit had to wait so long. Uh, they waited 14 years. Tolkien did not have uh, Bilbo's leisure. Um, of course, this all kind of was written during the period of World War II. Um, and then, you know, which obviously there was lots of stuff going on during World War II. Um, Two of Tolkien's uh, sons were, um, you know, were deployed in various capacities. Uh, Tolkien had his own responsibilities, and um, of course, Tolkien had other uh, labors as well. He was this was not his day job. He was not a professional novelist, if you will. Um, so there was a lot going on here, and of course, he was taking his time because he really wanted this to be. He had he had a great vision for this work. Um, he says it is not yet universally recognized as an important branch of study, meaning the study of Hobbit lore. Uh, it has indeed no obvious practical use, and those who go in for it can hardly expect to be assisted. Again, I feel like you could apply those same words to this podcast. Um, uh, just being about all things Tolkien, it uh, you know maybe not universally considered an important branch of study, though I think it is increasing, and it has no obvious practical use, and those who go in for it can hardly expect to be assisted. Uh, Maybe a little bit uh, harsh on that last bit there. I do feel like I get quite a bit of assistance from uh, from you, my listeners out there. So truly appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, does this hop, does this podcast have practical use? Uh, I think it has practical use in the sense of uh, being the most impractical things often have the greatest import import right? So perhaps no uh, practical use in a very worldly sense, strict worldly sense, but I think a very great practical use in the sense of the soul and of the spirit. All right. Um, and then paragraph six and seven, these are notes on the prologue, the maps, and other add-ons. Uh, nothing too crazy here. There's a little bit of uh, material at the very end uh, as far as pronunciations go. Uh, the dip thongs AI and AE and AU and AW represent sounds like those heard in brine and brown and not those in brain and brawn. So I, I like to make note of those just because they're particularly useful as I'm going through and reading different parts of the story. Um, there's a couple of other notes about how certain things are pronounced. Um, so yeah, this was just kind of a gloss of this first edition forward for the Lord of the Rings. Um, it's a, you know, Nothing too crazy about it. It's a pretty normal forward. Uh, Tolkien introduces the work at a broad level and briefly explains how it came to be. Um, on the other hand, there it is a little weird, right? Because Tolkien is writing as if 
he truly is pulling from um, uh, these historical works, kind of these ancient historical works that he's discovered. And, you know, this was an idea that he very much played around with over the course of his career and the composition of Middle Earth. I think in, in, in large sense, he truly kind of considered himself to be channeling something that came from somewhere else, right? Um, that, that, you know, he was not satisfied with the mere answer that, uh, you know, the, the works that he was composing, and maybe that others composed in their own right as well, were just simply these things that, kind of came out of nowhere from just the, you know, material of the brain, if you will. Um, Tolkien, I think, had a much higher view. And I think he was, I think he was sort of toying with that idea here that, you know, he had these other works that he was pulling from. And it's this, you know, he was playing along with this in-universe notion that the Red Book of Westmarch was a real thing, that it was a discovery, and that the tales of Middle Earth were actual history. Um, So, you know, it's really interesting to consider that and why why he was doing that. He doesn't do that as much in the second edition. Um, but I think there's just this beautiful mystical idea that Tolkien has that he, uh, you know, that that it's this whole all tales may come true kind of idea, right? That he touches on with on fairy stories. I won't spend a lot of time going into that right now, but this is one of the most endearing aspects of Tolkien's style and Tolkien's general tone for me. Uh, I don't know how the rest of uh, you out there feel about it, but I genuinely love when he uh, kind of plays around with this with this sort of idea. I feel like he doesn't get too cutesy about it either. Um, he's just he's just kind of going on this idea that hey, Bilbo and Frodo, uh, you know, were were real were real figures in a way. I kind of think about the show. <laughs> Been talking about this in my household recently because we've been watching the last the last season of Fargo season five, uh, the most recent one at this point. Um, and of course, one of the things that happens with that show and the original movie is that it starts off and says, you know, this is a true story, right? Of course, it's not a true story, not in the sense of like being uh, strictly true in a in a historical sense, but it it doesn't come right out and say that either, and. It's and, and so what is it doing there? Well, that's a very interesting question just by itself. Uh, is it just simply saying, like, trying to get us to think, like, well, there is great truth in this story, right? There are universal human truths within this story. Um, anyway, like, I, I just I just can really kind of go on for a long time about that whole question. I won't uh, spend too much on it right now. Um, but I love the idea when when writers of fiction play around with this idea of uh, of their stories being true, right? And using that word to describe them and challenging us to think to ourselves, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, so why was this first edition excluded from later editions? Well, there's a couple of reasons, really. Um, first, Tolkien didn't really seem to like it. Um, we find in The Peoples of Middle-Earth... In the second edition of 1966, this forward was rejected in its entirety. On one of his copies of the first edition, my father, so this is Christopher uh, quoting his father here, wrote beside it, This forward I should wish very much in any case to cancel. Confusing as it does, real personal matters with the machinery of the tale is a serious mistake. So uh, Tolkien just, as he went back on it and kind of thought through it later on, he was not happy with how this forward came off. Uh, Didn't like the idea of like kind of blending in actual history with the uh, in-universe history, if you will. However, Tolkien also needed new material for Ballantine Books, which was the U.S. publisher of the paperback version, so that they could renew the copyright against the unauthorized editions published by Ace Books. Um, You know, you might remember this controversy that happened in the mid-60s where this publishing company, Ace Books, uh, published paperback versions of Lord of the Rings, which Tolkien had not authorized, uh, had not approved, and then uh, he needed to kind of renew the copyright within the U.S. and so, or reinforce the copyright. And so he published uh, this ba- this paperback edition with Ballantine Books, uh, which ended up being uh, he included this forward to the second edition uh, in there, so that there would be new material associated with uh, these paperback versions of the Lord of the Rings. It would be much easier to reassert his copyright ownership of the text of the Lord of the Rings. 
Finally, as Hammond and Skull note in The Reader's Companion, he might have realized that the first edition forward contains a bit of a spoiler because he, at one point, kind of alludes to the fact that Sam and Frodo both apparently survive. Um, so, you know, why would you want to put that at the very beginning of this book where that's maybe a big question that's at stake? Um, so that's the uh, that's kind of an overview of the first edition of Forward to Lord of the Rings. Um, and now that we've covered that, let's move on to the second edition's Forward. All right. So the Forward to the Second Edition was published in 1965 with the Fellowship of the Ring. Let's break down what it contains. Um, all right. So paragraph one begun shortly after The Hobbit was... Uh, Tolkien lays out that the story was begun shortly after The Hobbit was completed and shortly before its publication. Uh, it was not finished for many years because legends of the Silmarillion and Numenor got in the way. Um, Tolkien had to come to the slow and painful realization that the Silmarillion would never see publication, at least not as things stood in the late 30s. Um, let me kind of just read again this first paragraph from uh, the forward to the second edition. This tale grew in the telling until it became a history of the Great War of the Ring and included many glimpses of the yet more ancient history that, uh, that preceded it. It was begun soon after The Hobbit was written and before its publication in 1937. But I did not go on with this sequel, for I wished first to complete and set in order the mythology and legends of the Elder Days, which had then begun taking shape for some years. I desired to do this for my own satisfaction, and I had little hope that other people would be interested in this work, especially since it was primarily linguistic in inspiration and was begun in order to provide the necessary background of history for Elvish tongues. All right. Uh, in the second paragraph, Tolkien says that the sequel was drawn irresistibly towards the older world, meaning the world of the Silmarillion, the world of the First Age, uh, these, this legendarium that Tolkien had been composing uh, for some 20 years at this point. Um, so, uh, you know, notice how Tolkien also in this paragraph speaks of discovery. He really acts as if he is discovering the history of Middle Earth and not inventing it. Now, he's not quite as sort of um, winking as he was in the first place. I think, you know, he, again, he's trying to get at this idea and he's developing this this idea in his own mind that that our inspirations, our artistic notions don't necessarily just simply begin with, the again, the material of our brain, this sort of very strict materialist notion of where inspiration comes from, but that uh, perhaps there are greater powers at work in inspiring us to write the stories that we tell. Uh, I Again, like, I, I agree with this notion. Um, and, you know, Tolkien, even as he calls these things histories, I think, you know, he's not crazy. He, does, he knows these aren't actual histories in kind of the, the strict sense of the word. Uh, but at the same time, you know, he's he's developing this notion that he's not just this isn't just some kind of pointless pointless um fancy if you will right that he's you know a, a waste of time uh but that he's actually doing a work he's he's discovering something along the way that doesn't necessarily just begin with him it's this whole beautiful idea of subcreation that he was so fond of uh in paragraph three tolkien says lord of the rings was composed between 1936 and 1949 uh, of course, there were several years after that in which uh, the revisions took place. Um, but so it took, you know, 13, 14 years. Uh, he had, of course, other interests and, of course, the war going on for six of those years. Um, he he made good progress uh, from 1939 until uh, 1941 when they arrived at Lothlorien and the Great River. Um, and it was kind of halting progress, right? He composed it in different bits uh composed most of book three at once and then a bit of book five and then had to come back to other parts of it um and then in paragraph four tolkien continues to provide an account of its composition uh around 1944 he detailed frodo's journey to mordor and got christopher's responses to it it took another five, five years to bring it to uh to really where the story ends um and he had to type the draft all himself right so uh you know just imagine a book of this length uh having to type that <laughs> all yourself uh, especially in those days before, uh, you know, before word processors, right, where it may have been a little easier to accomplish that. He was doing it all on typewriter. Um, I, I'm not sure if he was really, uh, you know, one to write on a typewriter normally or if that was something he had to do after writing it out by hand. Um, but nevertheless, just the notion of, like, typing this massive work out um, is, uh, is kind of mind-boggling. So, uh, so that took a lot of time as well you can really get a sense of the dedication in this, right? Um, beautiful, beautiful uh, sense of dedication to seeing this work through. 
Um, you can also kind of cut him some slack for never having <laughs> published much more about Middle Earth in his lifetime. Uh, he probably got it, you know, just, uh, you know, took up so much, so much of his life during this period. Um, and uh, he was probably pretty exhausted, uh, you know, mentally afterward. Paragraph five, um, he, he, he says something that I think is really wonderful. And, you know, he kind of goes into, um, he starts getting into these ideas about like, why did he write the book? Like, what was his motivation to do it? Um, and as he's going in, uh, to like some of the criticisms people have offered to it at this point, remember this is the second edition. So it's been out there for a while. Um, he says the one he agrees with most is that, uh, Tolkien is that he considers Lord of the Rings to be too short. Uh, we agree, right? So we, his readers agree. We wish it could be longer. We wish there could be uh, three more Lords of the Rings uh, out there type books, of course. Um, he says, The prime motive was the desire of a tale teller to try his hand at a really long story that, should, that would hold the attention of readers, amuse them, delight them, and at times maybe excite them or deeply move them. Um, so this is a key thing. Tolkien was not out there trying to write some story to make a point. He was trying to tell a wonderful story. And, uh, of course, we agree he did. Paragraph six, uh, he says, no, there was really no inner meaning or message. It's not allegorical or, and it's not topical. Uh, the story grew organically from the mind of its author. Its main theme was settled from the outset by the choice of the ring as the link between it and the Hobbit. Uh, he also lets us know that the shadow of the past was written well before the outbreak of war in 1939. So this is not some notion of like, you know, the war broke out. And so he starts writing the shadow of the past, which is this key chapter. Um, no, he started writing it before the war broke out. So, you know, while much of the story may be applicable to events of World War II, uh, it's not about World War II. It's not a uh, kind of, you know, uh, moralizing uh, uh, account that's meant to reflect World War II in large part. Uh, furthermore, in paragraph seven, Tolkien goes on to explain what the story would have looked like if he were trying to take to make the War of the Ring resemble World War II. Um, I just thought this was a pretty brilliant paragraph. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and read this and maybe talk a little bit about it. He says, the real, world, the real war does not resemble the legendary war in its process or its conclusion. If it had inspired or directed the development of the legend, then certainly the ring would have been seized and used against Sauron. He would not have been annihilated but enslaved, and Barad-dûr would not have been destroyed but occupied. Saruman, failing to get possession of the ring, would in the confusion and treacheries of the time have found in Mordor the missing links in his own researches into ring lore, and before long he would have made a great ring of his own with which to challenge the self-styled ruler of Middle-earth. In that conflict, both sides would have held hobbits in hatred and contempt. They would not long have survived even as slaves. Now, this is a very, <laughs> this is a very um, biting and even kind of like snarling uh uh paragraph aimed at the powers that be in general across the world uh in tolkien's time and especially after world war ii though tolkien was of course um you know uh, as i've outlined in in uh in a video on my youtube channel he he hated the nazis he very much despised the nazis um you know he was very much uh you know uh on the side of uh the allies if you will um in, in the sense of being very much against the Nazis. Um, he was not uh, Mr. Like, uh, rah, 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 the allies can only do good kind of guy. Okay. Um, he very much knew that on the side of the allies, there was, there were, you know, bad actors, there were evils being perpetrated. Um, and, and this last bit about, um, uh, hobbits being held in hatred and contempt by both sides, um, I think is, is maybe the most telling in sort of his perspective, right? Um, he did not look, he does not look at the powerful on either side as being like, uh, advocates of the common person, right? Of the average person. Um, he looks at them as trying to achieve their own interests. And, um, and I think that's just, it's kind of something he held really plays out in the history of the world, right? That, that the powerful, the rich, they may be on the side of good in a it, relatively speaking, um, but they're rarely just on the side of the good. Okay. Um, and they're rarely on the side of the common person. Uh, he says they would not long have survived even as slaves referring to the hobbits, uh, because 
uh, because of, you know, uh, how, how uh, the powerful tend to be. So this is a really interesting paragraph. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure exactly how to parse it as far as like Tolkien's whole idea that if we were to, uh, you know, try to try to make the War of the Ring reflect World War II in, in sort of a very like sort of, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, I'm not sure how, you know, how to map that all out here, uh, except it is to say like, um, really it's just a, you know, in, in this sense, it's not a, uh, you know, Tolkien maybe did not view World War II as a, as a victory for the common man, right? Uh, he viewed it as a uh, victory for one group of the powerful, right? Uh, one coalition of the powerful, if you will. So, um, and again, like a much more favorable uh, group of the powerful, you know, versus the Nazis and the Japanese Empire, uh, but still, um, you know, not necessarily... Uh, we don't necessarily have Aragorn ending up on the throne at the end of World War II, do we? All right. Um, so um, he goes into paragraph eight and his famous distaste for allegory. Uh, he says, I cordially dislike allegory. Uh, he much prefers history, truer feigned with its varied applicability. Uh, let's read this whole quote here. I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations and always have done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence. I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability to that to the thought and experience of readers. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purpose domination of the author. So what Tolkien is saying here is that it's fine if people take away kind of like parallels, if they see parallels in the real world events with certain things, uh, that's going to happen in any story, right? And it relies on the freedom of the reader, and that's what makes it uh, favorable in Tolkien's mind. It's not him imposing a certain um, a certain way of viewing the text on the reader, but it's saying, hey, you know, here's the story, and let your mind do with it what you will. Uh, and that's why there's such wonderful applicability uh, in various ways. Uh, paragraph 9, Tolkien says, further uh, gives further thoughts on Lord of the Rings as allegory of World War I or World War II. Uh, he says, an author cannot, of course, remain wholly unaffected by his experience, but the ways in which a story germ uses the soil of experience are extremely complex, and attempts to define the process are at best guesses from evidence that is inadequate and ambiguous. So again, he's saying, you know, he, yeah, he was probably influenced by different things that were going on during both wars and in the intervening period. Um, you know, he was aware of, uh, of different events taking place in the world. Um, but that, again, does not mean that, you know, he set out to write this story based on those events. Um, what really happens with any work is that a, a, uh, a writer is affected by his own experiences and his own knowledge of the events of the world. And that all kind of plays in uh, to his mind, his or her mind, as they, uh, as they compose the tale. So, um, you know, it's a very mysterious process, isn't it? Uh, this process of uh, inspiration leading to artistic creation. Um, but uh, I think it's a more beautiful process when the, uh, when the author is true to the vision, right? Is true to the vision of the story and not so concerned with uh, moralizing or being topical in the application of the story. My favorite stories are always the ones that are just true to an artistic vision, uh, if I'm being honest. He offers some thoughts on the scouring of the Shire. He says it's not meant to reflect the conditions in England at any particular period. Um, it's it's just, it's a very much a part of the story, right? Um, it's a very important part of the story. Um, so, uh, you know, again, no part of this is meant to be a commentary on something going on in the real world. Uh, it's supposed to be a story unto itself, though it will have applicability to the events of the real world, right? It'll have kind of a way in which we can view the events unfolding before us and understand the dynamics that are going on. I think if there's any big dynamic that, you know, you want to pay attention to, it's this notion of um, of the powerful of the world sort of wrestling with one another. And even as the common people uh, kind of get, um, you know, kind of get dragged under the wheels of it often, right? Um, and, you know, what's the common person to do? Uh, the common person is to act, uh, you know, act heroically in as much as it becomes them, right? In as much as they have the opportunity to do so, right? Um, I think that's one big takeaway, certainly, I have so far in this do not be hasty journey. Um, 
All right, and then paragraph 10 is just uh, kind of give some, you know, admin updates, if you will, on uh, on this new edition. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a summary of this second edition forward. Lots of good stuff in there. I highly recommend uh, reading this second edition forward. Uh, I think it's one of Tolkien's best essays, and it really helps you understand where he was coming from as he wrote Lord of the Rings and as he reflected back 10 years after its publication and its success, um, you know, what he had to say about it, right? What he wanted people to understand about this story. And the beautiful thing is mostly he just wanted people to appreciate it as a story, right? He wanted people to just be able to take it at face value and not uh, not try to be like, well, you know, this obviously stands for this real world thing. Tolkien was trying to make a commentary on this, okay? Uh, if he was trying to make a commentary on anything, it was uh, very abstract notions, very high-level notions uh, about human nature in general, I would say. All right. Well, most of you, like me, often skip over forwards to the books we read. In the case of Lord of the Rings, we get important insights directly from the mouth of the professor himself. Most of all, we learn that he had little ulterior motive for writing Lord of the Rings other than to tell a story that he felt compelled to tell. However, in his long dedication to achieving his magnum opus, he gave millions of readers a truly life-changing and life-affirming work. I, for one, find his reflections in these forwards to be highly worthwhile, and I hope you do as well. All right. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider supporting us in one or all of the following ways. First, join the Fellowship of the Road by visiting patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. When you join the Fellowship of the Road, it helps us to keep on everything on and lend you some cool perks along the way. Learn more at patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Second, if you're watching, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and let us know what's on your mind in the comments below. Finally, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes or the platform of your choice. If you are a five-star fan of The Tolkien Road, you can really help us out by heading over to iTunes or your preferred source for the show and dropping us a rating and review. When you do that, it helps get the word out about The Tolkien Road, which helps us to keep on evering on. As always, keep the correspondence coming. We'll do our best to respond to you somehow and at some point. With Do Not Be Hasty, we'll let the mail pile up and then do a big mailbag episode at the end of each chapter. While we can't promise you that our mail, that your mail will be read on air, you miss 100% of 100% of the shots you don't take. So drop those comments and send those emails. Finally, don't forget to stop by TrueMissPress.com for great merch like Super Stylin' and comfy Tolkien Road t-shirts, two trees, camper mugs, and signed copies of my books, Tolkien's Requiem and Tolkien's Overture. Once again, that's TrueMissPress.com. Thanks for supporting our work with your purchase. All right, and to close, as always, I'd like to thank our amazing fellowship. I know all of you have as well as I should like, and I've thanked less than half of you half as well as you deserve. Special thanks to the following. John R., Caitlin of Tea with Tolkien, KG, Melkor27, Saber Systems, Jeremy D., Emilio P., Jonathan D., Richard K., Paul D., Julia, Wordy, Chris B., 2or91, Carolyn S., Emil K., Brian O. the Second. Jonathan R., Matthew W., Daniel D., Harrison C., Jason C., Seb M., Wilbo Baggins, Ms. Anonymous, Andrew T., Red Hawk, Shannon S., Brian O. the First, Zeke F., James L., Chris L., Aja V., Ish of the Hammer, Teresa C., David of Pints with Jack, and Eric B. Finally, thanks to all for watching and are listening. Until next time, the road goes ever on. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>